different lists of programs and things like that. And then aircommunity.org is the website that we maintain. And there's information on all the different community meetings, previous recommendation documents. We're putting up the um, recommendations from the working groups that we're going to be talking about and voting on tomorrow. We've also been putting up the presentations that people have sent us, the, just the slide decks. I think we only have a couple, and it's, uh, but we'll have those up pretty soon. So anybody who's got uh, wants to share their slides, we can put it up on aircommunity.org. So we'd like to get started. We'll have a session moderated by George Giorgio, and then we're going to have a discussion about the um, a, a final discussion, hopefully, on the uh, governance. And then we arrive at the restaurant around 6.30 for dinner at 7. So we'll have a group leave the lobby of the hotel around 6 and take the metro one stop and then walk from the metro. So those are all the th details I can think of. So thanks to George for moderating. You can walk, I think, from here. It's about a mile and a half. Or you take one metro stop and it's go to the metro and it's just a six minutes from the metro. So yeah, or take a cab basically. So, but we'll we'll have a group leaving from the lobby at six and take the metro, or maybe share cabs. We could have people grouping there too to share cabs at six. Okay. So George is here. Our Thank leader. you. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Felix. Thank you for, for inviting me to talk this great meeting. I was at the first symposium back in Vancouver when, yeah, Dan is <laughs> raising his eyebrows when a bunch of us came together and thought that it's a good idea, and here we are now, and it's become a major effort, which is great because there's so many challenges in the field. And as if there weren't enough challenges in uh, basically standardizing and providing a framework for TCRs and BCRs. There's all these other uh, data that one perhaps may want to include in the analysis of adaptive immune responses, and that's part of what this session is going to be about. So I'm going to, I guess, give the first presentation. I was asked to, but um, when it comes up. Or I can talk about the wiki home. <laughs> Thank you. We're doing a lot of work on the uh, B-cell repertoire, but primarily we're excited about the serum antibody repertoire for two reasons. First, because, well, actually, at the end of the day, when you talk about uh, the effector factor, uh, fun, uh, factor arm of human immunity is really the antibody circulation that do things like clear pathogens or cause autoimmune disease or uh, clear apoptotic debris. So it's really the circulating antibody proteins that have uh, a biological function. And second, because there is very little known about the serum antibody response and, and the serum antibody repertoire, and it's a little harder to analyze, and, and therefore there is a whole lot of uh, questions that can be asked. So first, two things that are very important. Uh, we both, because we buy our own Kool-Aid, we think that the serological response and the serological repertoire is where the action is, because these are the antibodies that mediate a clinical outcome. And also something that's very important to keep in mind is unlike the uh, B-cell receptor repertoire, the serological repertoire is much, much less diverse, and there is a very good reason for that. If you had millions and millions of antibodies present at concentrations related, uh, comparable to, your, to the KD, to the equilibrium dissociation constant for binding to antigen, then basically you will need to have, you know, many grams per mil of antibody uh, per mil of serum, which is of course not feasible. So the antibody repertoire has to be restricted. And in fact, our estimates and those of others estimate the diversity of uh, physiologically relevant antibodies in serum and in secretions at about 15 to 20 thousand clonotypes, and we can talk about that later. So in order to analyze the serological repertoire, you need technologies, and Inaki was very kind to show a version of our slide. Uh, basically, what we do is we do um, LCMS-MS proteomics, 
uh, very deep runs uh, with very high mass accuracy. You have to use Orbitrap or orbit technology or the like for uh, mass accuracy and get collect a lot of spectra uh, from long uh, mass spectrometry runs, typically from antibodies that have been affinity purified uh, by um, chromatography on immobilized antigen, but also you can use the entire unfractionated serum and, and run it and basically trypsinize it and, and do bottom-up proteomics on the serum. That's hard to do, but you can do it and it just requires more work. And then, in order to be able to interpret the spectra, you need, of course, some information on what are the likely proteins to be present in the serological repertoire, which means you need information from B-cell sequencing. And since uh, most uh, earlier uh, technologies for BCR sequencing, uh, dealt with the sequencing of either the heavy or the light chain. Uh, we developed a technology or actually a set of technologies for sequencing both the heavy and the light chain. Uh, Brandon Dekoski, who pioneered this work in the lab and then went on to do even greater things at the VRC, and now he's gone to do even greater things at his own position at Kansas City here in the audience, and he's the one who came up with um, this uh, latter part of the pipeline. <clears throat> but the analysis as follows, it's very simple. Well, it's not very simple, but the way it works as follows. We do CDRH3 spectrotyping. We look primarily, although not exclusively, at the peptides that originate from the CDRH3 region because they're hypervariable. And we quantitate this from the LC uh, run by peak intensity. The sensitivity, which we have validated on a number of occasions with uh, isobaric pep peptides, is down to 10 nanograms per milliliter of serum. So it's actually quite a sensitive technique. We know that we cover at least 70% of the top 30 most abundant clones and probably at least 60% of the entire repertoire. And this is something that is in a manuscript in preparation. And the way we know that is because a lot of the uh, fragments that we detect from um, CDR peptides essentially contain the J segment. So we know the J segment. And if we cannot identify the MS2 for the rest of the peptide, we know that this is not something that is in our database. But uh, most of the time, we can identify uh, the, especially the abundant antibodies. And once we have the CDRH3, then we can detect and determine what the full length uh, uh, sequence of this particular antibody is from the paired heavy light chain database. We can make the antibody and study its functional characteristics and then use it in animal studies and what have you. So the <coughs> high throughput sequen uh, single B cell sequencing technology, that's the uh, version 2.0, now we're at version 3.0, which is even more efficient and has higher uh, efficiency in terms of a number of clonotypes that you can get per number of input cells and also sensitivity and simplicity of use. Hopefully sometime a sample will publish it. Basically entails encapsulating cells in uh, single cell droplets and then creating a paired, an, an amplicon, uh, in which the heavy and the light chain are linked. And this is actually quite convenient for two reasons. Uh, for, for, for two reasons. First, because it simplifies the workflow. But secondly, because you can now take these uh, uh, amplicons, these pieces of DNA that contain both the heavy and the light chain, and subclone them in various display platforms. And we use yeast display in particular, and express FABs that represent the repertoire in yeast. And if you ask, why on earth do you want to do this? The reason is that yeast, unlike B cells, is really rugged. You can grow yeast for many, many generations. You can do screens in a number of different conditions to identify um, specificity, affinity of different clones in the repertoire, stability, and other parameters that are meaningful. Uh, also, you can take the heavy and the light chain sequences and you can do massive um, computational modeling during, during Rosetta. We've done that in the past for about three or 4,000 antibody sequences and just begin to get some idea of the structural landscape of a particular repertoire uh, so that you can understand what are the features in a broader sense that may be responsible for antigen recognition and reactivity or other aspects of the repertoire that are of interest. Regarding the, what I mentioned before, this is a brief description of the uh, system. I think the paper is coming out very shortly. 
um, in nature biotechnology. Basically, we take the heavy and the light chains, and we we um, using a clever, uh, I think a clever. Uh, trick, which I didn't come up with, so I can say it's clever because it's not self-congratulatory. Uh, the graduate students did. Uh, using a very clever trick, uh, you can actually express the FABs on yeast. Uh, the trick was to develop a display system where you can actually uh, produce and display with high fidelity uh, all human antibodies, because most display technologies like single chain, like phase display, what have you, basically display only a portion of the antibody that you're trying to display. Many of them are not compatible with the protein secretion or the protein folding machinery of uh, the cell. In this particular case, you have to force dimerization of the um, uh, heavy and the light chain and co-express chaperones to ensure that antibodies from humans actually are displayed with high fidelity in yeast. And then you can use yeast for uh, screening purposes, which we've done. These are two examples um, that we've studied in more detail. The first one is uh, plasma blast, uh, basically antibody secreting cells from a a uh, donor that was vaccinated with an Ebola uh, experimental vaccine. And sure enough, we get a number of antibodies after about two rounds of sorting. As you might expect, these are plasma blasts by and large from the peak blast um, response. So these are largely antigen specific. Some of these have very high affinities. Many of them, many of these are also neutralizing because with Ebola, you make antibodies to the Ebola glycoprotein and a large number of these antibodies are neutralizing a lot of other infectious diseases and that's established in the literature. This is a somewhat more challenging experiment. This is basically the steady state, the B-memory repertoire from somebody that was infected with flu, uh, not infected, vaccinated with flu, but that was many, many months earlier. And at that point, when we actually took uh, a sample of B cells, the frequency of flu-specific B cells was very low, but we took uh, a large number of cells, again, determined the, uh, or created amplicons of the heavy and the light chains uh, in the repertoire and then um, display them in yeast. And after four rounds of sorting, we got a bunch of antibodies that were specific to the different components of the flu vaccine. This is a trivalent vaccine, so it has an H1 and H3 uh, or a group 1 and a group 2 and uh, a, a B uh, component. And we got antibodies that are both high affinity and also neutralize very well the specific, uh, the respective strains. So it works quite well, and we think it's a nice way to be able to not only get access to the sequence of the repertoire, but also understand specificity and, more importantly, cross-reactivity at a high-throughput level, at a, in, a, in, a high, in high throughput, which I think will be significant for a number of biological studies. But what I wanted to discuss is basically uh, the... Oh, another thing that's really... Well, I like to think it's really cool. And again, it's not something that I came up with. Uh, it's a student that had the idea. Uh, in antibody repertoire analysis, one of the key issues is how do, you, how do you reconstruct the phylogeny of this antibody and how this particular antibody was derived from an unmutated common ancestor. And there is a number of phylogenetic uh, maximum likelihood tree methods and so on, but there is a lot of ambiguity in these trees and you can actually reconstruct the trees pretty much any way you like and you can get hundreds of trees that will give you more or less the same result. So what uh, Eric Johnson in the group realized or, or appreciated is that in addition to the V gene, the uh, intron is actually mutated, is a target of AID, and unlike the V gene, the intron is not subject to selection. So you can actually use the intronic landscape to chronologically order the sequences in a repertoire based on when they appeared and then reconstruct the uh, chronology and the phylogeny of this particular um, antibody lineage. So it works like this. Uh, if you have, in this instance, do I have a pointer? Okay. You have in this instance, for instance, a large tree of, um, of sequences. Uh, this is, uh, again, um, uh, using conventional phylogeny, basically. Uh, you can look at the uh, intronic repertoire. That means that you have to sequence and somehow develop a method to not only sequence the heavy chain, but also sequence the intron, and look at the accumulation of mutations. And of course, 
uh, of course, uh, clones that have a single mutation in the intron uh, will have appeared or must have appeared before those other two or three and so on until you get to the final uh, antibody sequence that, that is of interest. And if you ask, why do you care? Well, this is an example where you do care. This is for this is an analysis of the uh, evolution of antibodies in a very well-studied donor down the road from here, an HIV-1 um, uh, elite neutralizer, uh, CAP-256, for whom several nature and immunity papers have been written about, the, anti the antibodies and the, how these antibodies arise. And the point I'm trying to make is that by using this approach, you can actually derive computationally antibodies that have a very significant neutralization breadth and that have emerged much, much, much earlier than the antibodies that could be detected experimentally by very, very extensive and, and, and time-consuming B-cell cloning and neutralization assays. And specifically, we had antibodies that we could detect that, were, that appeared about three months earlier than the earlier broadly neutralizing antibodies that had been seen before and have very significant, significant neutralization breadth, and some that were available even before. So the reason why I'm saying this is that in addition to the VH and the VL, actually the interns contain useful information that at some point in the future, after I retire, may be part of the uh, sequence database and the data sets that will be analyzed in immune response, in, in B cell immune responses. So I want to talk about the serum antibody repertoire, and I realize I have about probably three minutes or five minutes, so I'm just going to highlight some of the features of the antibody repertoire that we've seen over and over again in the analysis of about roughly 80 donors in a number of different settings. So first of all, the serum antibody repertoire is always highly polarized in the sense that you have some antibody clonotypes that are hugely overrepresented in the antibody repertoire, and they uh, uh, they comprise a big part of the titer. There are instances, and I can show you some examples. I will show you some examples later on, where basically 80% of the titer to a particular antigen is a single antibody. So the response is often highly oligoclonal. Not always, though. In this particular case, we um, uh, we we saw the results. We present the results in this kind of in this manner, basically as a histogram, where each line corresponds to a different antibody clonotype. And the um, size or the y-axis represents the relative abundance of that clonotype in the repertoire. And typically for vaccines and even for primary infection, the antibody repertoire, or what we can detect at least, because there may be things that we cannot detect, is typically uh, roughly the clonotypic diversity is between 20 and 100 to 150 antibodies. And you only get so many different antibodies to a particular antigen under conditions where you have a high titer. So high titers, well, more antibody diversity. This is another example of a pneumovax uh, vaccinated individual. Again, we have 15, 20 different clonotypes that are antigen specific. Forget about the green lines. These are non-antigen specific. This is what we see in the illusion uh, from the affinity column, but we also uh, have useful information that comes out of that part of the analysis that is not really relevant to this conversation, but it's something that we record. So the serological repertoire is highly polarized with a few antibody lineages accounting for at least 50% of the serum titled to the antigen. And the clonal diversity is actually quite restricted. You don't get thousands and thousands of antibodies. You have a few antibodies of which a very small number are particularly significant for the response to the antigen. This is very important in terms of the biological response and, um, and, and what the immune system does in terms of being able to confer protection to a particular antigen. Uh, another thing that's very important is a very small portion of the plasma blast at the peak response, let alone the B memory cells that are antigen specific, are actually represented in the serological repertoire. So if you're looking at the B memory repertoire, this is wonderful. Okay, you can find a lot of information about the diversity of the of, of the uh, of the B memory response. However, it's not going to be mapping to the serological memory, the circulating antibodies, which again are the ones that recognize antigen. 
In fact, um, for the uh, memory repertoire, we know that only about one in a thousand of the antigen-specific B memory cells actually is represented in the uh, serum. Again, for many antigens, maybe some instances will be different, but so far this has been our experience. And uh, less than 3% of the peak plasma blood response, which raises the question, what on earth makes some B cells likely to expand more and mature and develop to long-lived plasma cells so that we, they can produce a large amount of antibody that will be biologically meaningful. And we have no idea what the answer to this question is, but that's what we'd love to know. And eventually, you know, we're doing more studies um, in a number of ways and with different groups to hopefully uh, get a better understanding of what is it that makes certain B cells actually likely to contribute to the serological response. So number three, as you get older, your serological repertoire becomes more and more uh, polarized, more and more skewed in the sense that you have some clones, some antibody clones that are present at huge amounts, like several hundred micrograms and even a milligram per mil. Now, in cancer, and for those of you who are of medical, have a medical background, you probably know that there are are in multiple myeloma and in pre-multiple myeloma, there's a condition called MGAS in which you can have a single immunoglobulin that basically accounts for 95% of your total response. But that's a pre-malignant condition. We're talking about people that are not diagnosed in any way with MGAS or anything like that. We're talking about normal 50 plus year old uh, donors in which we know that the repertoire is highly polarized. We don't know if that's because there are benign plasma cell expansions that contribute to high levels of antibody or because these antibodies do something functional and important uh, that, um, that remains to be seen. Something that's actually quite peculiar, but very often in vaccines, in, in effective vaccines, what we see is that actually the antibodies that are highly represented, that are enlisted by the vaccine, not surprisingly, is super efficacious in terms of neutralization. So it's a circular argument, but if you have a vaccine that works well, it stands to reason that it elicits antibodies that are abundant and actually are really protective or neutralizing against the vaccine. This is exemplified in a study that we've done with an activated polio vaccine. Remember, um, most of us have been uh, vaccinated with uh, either the attenuated or the inactivated polio vaccine, depending on when you were born. And, and these particular individuals, this is a, a cohort of eight individuals, were revaccinated uh, with an activated polio vaccine. There are three different serotypes, and titers of one of eight are seropositive. Then we looked at the repertoire of these individuals. This is an example of three individuals. Um, basically, this is the repertoire in light blue of different antibodies that were present before boost. And this is what happens after boost. And you can tell that in some instances, some clones expanded enormously to 60% of the repertoire. This is actually validated again with isobaric peptides. It is 60% of the repertoire. In some other cases, 30% of the repertoire. Most of the uh, clones that were observed in the repertoire after boost were pre-existing clones that were boosted, but there were also a few clones that were listed by the vaccine that we couldn't detect earlier. What is interesting is if you uh, make antibodies for all these abundant clones, these are insanely potent neutralizing clones that neutralize with titers that are 100,000 or more um, and, and in many cases, they neutralize two different serotypes of the virus. So I think statistically, it's quite, quite striking that all the abundant antibodies seem to be uh, protective. This is, again, quite often the case for effective vaccines in our experience, and it doesn't say anything. The immune system doesn't select for neutralization, except that probably we have good vaccines because they can mediate that effect. So finally, another feature of the antibody response, I apologize for this figure, but I couldn't break it up into parts. And the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that the serological response is actually quite stable over multiple years. This is an analysis of the serological response of a very special donor from Antonio Lanzavecchia. This particular donor was a donor that gave rise to a number of very potent and very broad breath 
neutralizing antibodies to influenza. And this person uh, has been vaccinated a number of times, was infected first with the 2009 pandemic, but was vaccinated at least once a year, every year for the subsequent years. We took serum at all these points and analyzed the repertoire. And I want to point out what the initial repertoire was at 2009, what the repertoire at 2014 was, and all the lines that are in color here, antibodies that were present in, at both time points. And as you can see, a number of antibodies, a number of abundant antibodies for that matter, actually are present and persist for a long time in circulation. Uh, in fact, the fraction of persistent antibodies found over a period of, 60, of, of six years, despite all this immunization, about roughly 45%, uh, at any time point. And what I'm showing here, and this is a little more complicated, is the composition of the repertoire at different time points. And what is shown as a different color is antibodies that are present at high levels at one or at, at multiple time points, persistent antibodies. So, for example, this particular antibody was present at large amounts early on, and it's present at even larger amounts uh, four year, uh, five years later. So the point I'm trying to make, which is not surprising from the point of view of the um, basically uh, bone marrow plasma cell biology, is that the antibodies in serum, uh, the antibodies that produce the serological, I'm sorry, the cells that produce the serological response persist for long times and produce antibodies for extended period of times. In flu, this is actually very important because there is a phenomenon called original, original antigenic scene, or now it's called um, serological imprinting, which means basically whatever happened earlier on that fixed, if you will, your serological response will have a very significant impact on how you can respond to challenge by different viruses or different vaccines, and it could actually attenuate or reduce your ability to respond to a new uh, strain of influenza. So point is, the serological repertoire is actually, the serological memory is actually quite stable over a number of years in these and other donors. So I'd like to uh, then just briefly say something about cancer and the serological repertoire, because I have no idea what this is about. But uh, I'm not there, but I know what this is about, but I don't know how to interpret this data. We looked at the uh, draining lymph node uh, repertoire and the serological repertoire from two, uh, two different uh, triple negative breast cancer patients. And what you found, what we found in both instances is huge expansions of um, particular B cells. And you can see this in, uh, in this mosaic plot. So basically three antibodies are by far the, the most abundant in this particular um, repertoire. And it turns out that this antibody in particular is a antibody specific to uh, a well-known uh, intracellular cancer, antig uh, cancer antigen, NYESO1, which is actually important for therapeutic purposes as well. These are a very expanded lineages of um, uh, uh, B cells in the draining leaf node. We isolated and and uh, synthesized several of these antibodies. And as you might expect, uh, the more somatically hypermutated antibodies bind even with higher affinity relative to the less somatically hypermutated antibodies. These are all again in the draining leaf node. Uh, this is pretty clear evidence for um, antigen-driven selection. And you find this antibody and you can detect it proteomically extremely well and at large amounts in circulation. So not only you have B cells that are stimulated by an antigen in the draining leaf node, but also these B cells mature to plasma cells or plasma blasts and produce large amounts of antibody. Now, what is the significance for the progression of, disease, of the disease? We do not know, but I think it's quite striking. And it's important to keep in mind that in cancer, there is actually a pretty strong response to at least some cancer antigens. And, and that is accompanied not only by um, a development, a B cell development and maturation, but also by the uh, secretion of significant amounts of antibodies to these particular uh, antigens. 
I'd like to stop here and thank the many, many people that helped with these studies or contributed to these studies. Uh, Greg Ippolito is a, um, a strong, a close collaborator of mine. He's also a faculty at uh, UT Austin. Uh, several uh, terrific uh, former students and postdocs. I'd like to stop and thank Brandon Dekoski, who's here and has set up his lab at Kansas and was responsible for a lot of the paired sequencing technologies. Uh, Yariv Wein, who essentially set up the pipeline for the uh, proteomic uh, work that I described, and he's now at Tel Aviv University and several others, and also a very large list of collaborators. And I've only said the collaborators that I presented some data from their work, but there are several others that are not shown here. Thank you very much. And I'm... Can I take questions or do I have time? No, yes. Okay, I have a little time. I've been to one mic before. <laughs> and um, if you do serologic repertoires, mm -hmm. so are those clones from the ser Can you find those? antibodies from the serologic clones, the circulating B cells. In other words, what is the origin of those antibodies? Is it from circulating B cells? Can you find them? Or is it from um, plasma blasts that live in the bone marrow that are secreting or secondary lymph node organs? I mean, because we're doing repertoires here, right? right. From the That's peripheral blood. So what's the connection or disconnection? Right. That's, a, that's an excellent question. So first of all, in order to be able to detect a antibody sequence in uh, by proteomics, you have to have a DNA sequence uh, for or from a corresponding B cell, and that corresponding B cell sequence could either be from a B memory cell or a plasma blast. Now, when you have plasma blast, post-infection peak plasma blast, you know uh, probably 70% of those will be represented, uh, or or 70% of the antibodies in the repertoire will be represented in among the peak plasma blasts. If you look at uh, the B memory response, only the B memory cells, there is a very small percentage of the B memory cells that will be represented in the, um, in the serological response. The reason is that the uh, colonal relatives of these B memory cells have migrated to the bone marrow and they are long-lived PCs. So if you look now at long-lived PCs, you cannot look at too many long-lived PCs because then you have to draw a huge aspirate from someone to, 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 to... You cannot do the experiment that Jim did earlier with leukophoresis because you cannot take somebody's the entire you know, uh, bone marrow uh, from someone to look at the entire repertoire. But if you look at the repertoire, yes, you do see those clones in the bone marrow. Correct. I mean, I think, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, for those of you who are B-cell immunologists, but because B-cell division is asymmetric, right, when you have a plasma blast or that is formed or antibody secreting cell, you will have a corresponding B-memory cell that will be generated. So you do have those cells in the periphery. The question is how abundant they are. When you're sequencing the intron, how much of the regular VDJ do you get as well? Well, we sequence because of, uh, see, uh, that's another thing that I should mention. Uh, these technologies are limited by how long a sequence you can read. And, and, and we do pair end sequence. So typically we sequence about 200, 250 base pairs of the intron. We want to be able to sequence more. So we now have a, another trick for, to be able to sequence more, but we haven't really uh, completed that work. If I understand correctly, you're sequencing the intron plus some of the VDJ as well, or are you just correct? We're sequencing no, we sequence parent reads, right? We sequence the we we amplify the intron and the VDJ, correct? And they're barcoded, so you can actually sequence. Yeah. I might ask the same question, kind of, but so did you compare the your phylogeny to the one that was done about you know by that? the antibodies from that donor before the oh absolutely absolutely yeah. and the thing is you can if you if you use basically you know like uh, uh, 
standard ML trees. You know, you can actually create, and that's, some, that's the dirty little cigarette of phylogeny. You can actually come to, you can come up with hundreds of different trees that have uh, trees that have similar bootstrap values. So which one is is true, right? And especially if you're interested in mutations that are critical for the development of the lineage, you have to have additional information. I think even more importantly, they they present that as one B cell lineage in that, you know, and, and I wonder if looking at the introns, if you saw this multiple lineages compared to one lineage, but anyway. Well, what's more actually more. very interesting is if you do the internomic analysis, what you see is you, you see actually mutations that come up early in the lineage and then they disappear and then actually they reappear later in the lineage. So... And you won't be able to find those if you just do VDJ, if you do VGIN, you know. Maybe there are multiple lineages in there. Yeah. So if you like this, yeah, be nice to our paper. It's under review somewhere. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Jamie is running. We don't have any more questions. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Ganilla Carlson Hedelstam, who is going to talk about genetic diversity of non-human primate and human germline IGTs. Great, so thanks very much. Um, Thanks, George, and uh, thanks to the uh, organizers for inviting me. It's been really nice to meet a lot of people that were only names on papers for me before. Uh, but so my talk will focus uh, on ID Discover, and it will follow up directly on the talk Martin gave yesterday and the discussion we had about inferring germline genes. But I'll give you a little bit of context and show you some more data uh, and what sort of information we can uh, derive from using ID Discover. Uh, so my lab is basically... Let's see how it's um, moving with the arrows, or? I just advance. OK, now it's doing it. OK, it's alive. Um, yeah, so our lab is, is a basic. Uh, standard sort of basic B-cell biology lab. We're interested in understanding B-cell responses to foreign antigens. And to do that, we really need to get down to the genetics of the antibody. And so we've been increasingly interested in this, and, and this is what this talk will focus on. But we have uh, some of the projects we absolutely need this, because we study the response to vaccine antigens. And we do that by, uh, first of all, the standard methods of looking at the polyclonal serological response. But of course, uh, that is coupled with looking at the B cells themselves, their phenotypes, their function, and then we isolate monoclonal antibodies because that's the only way to really dissect the polyclonal response and understand what is responding to which epitopes are we getting uh, dominant responses to and how are those responses competing against each other during the evolution of the response. What we're doing increasingly is to trace these antibody sequences. So once we have a panel of antibodies, uh, we can actually then trace them by using next-generation sequencing, by uh, generating libraries from different immune compartments. Uh, and this is just an example of, of this. A lot of this work is done in non-human primates. So the reasons we can model has become very important for us. It's, of course, the model that's most common, most similar to the hu human genetics. And this is, uh, this is really one of the advantages with the non-human primates. They're outbred. Uh, they are extremely diverse. Uh, but their gene, their VG, VDJ genes are typically around 90 to 95% homologous. So there is, uh, in terms of a model for human biology, we believe that this is an important model. So what we typically do after an immunization is to isolate antigen-specific memory B cells. And we do that with antigen-specific probes that are matched to the immunogen. And we sort single cells. And we've done this over many years from many studies. Uh, in a typical study, we might uh, sort the number of 96 well plate, we clone the antibodies. But once we clone the antibodies from a, a specific gate, as shown here, 
uh, we can also we, we can validate that that is really antigen specific cells because we express the antibodies and functionally confirm that they're binding the antigen. And so we, we sometimes also derive just look at the heavy chain sequences from some of these uh, single sorted cells. So in this particular example I show you here, we have perhaps up to 100 functional expressed antibodies cloned and about and a, about a thousand heavy chains, but from the same gate. Uh, and then we can uh, basically clone the antibodies, see where they bind. And in this case, um, just giving an example of, of a set of antibodies we published uh, this year. And this is basically uh, antibodies that recognize the, the apex of the HIV arm trimer. So these are vaccine-induced antibodies that neutralize certain strains of HIV. We want to understand how you can target this antibody response on conserved regions. It's a big question in the HIV field, of course. Um, an ongoing study is to follow these lineages then, and this is uh, really led by Ganesh Pad in the lab, who is working with um, Pradipa Pushparai, and both graduate students sequencing and tracing all these lineages in all immune compartments uh, that we can isolate from these animals. Uh, so, so this is uh, a study that's be just being finished, and uh, will I not talk about here today. But to do this, lineage tracing, we absolutely need to know the starting point. We need to know the germline genes that this particular animal has. Because if you use incorrect germline genes for your assignments and all of the subsequent tracing and studies of antibody evolution, you're sort of, you're being misled. So starting off knowing the germline genes is very important for our questions. And we've learned over the years that rhesus macaques are extremely diverse, uh, more so than humans. And uh, the databases have just been started to be built up now. Uh, this is, they're still very incomplete, and they probably will be for a long time because we're not likely to reach saturation because they're so diverse. The diversity is much greater than humans. This is known from MHC uh, sequencing, so it's known that macaques are more diverse than humans. So how then should we do this? And the only way that we sort of that we landed with was that we have to look at the individual animal. We have to to look at the animal from which we isolate the antibodies, and that's how we uh, developed IT Discover basically, so that we could, from a given animal or a given human, generate a personalized or individualized database of V genes and, and hopefully D and J as well. That's ongoing. So you've, I think at least some of you here have seen this paper we published last year. And in this paper, we describe the sort of um, the algorithm and the idea behind ID Discover, and we apply it both to humans, rhesus macaques, and mice to sort of show that it, it works equally well in all those species. Um, there is, um, I think, you know, a lot more additions to ID Discover now. And I think for those of you who are using it, you will see that there is very several newer versions that have additional modules from what we had when we published this paper. Uh, for example, J, uh, Jane Discovery um, and um, various other modules. So I'm just going to show this as an example of why it's important to know your germlines. Currently in IMDT, uh, the number of rhesus macaque germline genes are very limited. There's 52 genes in, in the database currently but only 19 of those are functional. So we have a very limited database that's publicly available. We published in, in 2012 um, a database of 65 germline V genes that were derived from the Gibbs et al, um, basically the reference rhesus macaque genome paper that came out in Science 2007. Uh, and, and that's a more complete database, but it's of course not at all complete, um, as complete as you would like because of this diversity. So this slide is really showing what it looks like if we make an IDG library and we assign it to three different databases. So here, assigning it to IMDT, you can see that there's only one VH4 gene in IMDT, so the, all of the VH4s, which is the biggest family, assigned to that. And that's, of course, wrong. Uh, if we assign it to the bigger database, it looks better. And if we assign it to a database we made from this same animal that we made the IDG library from, so here we've made an IDM library, from this animal first and made a database. Now you start to see a good representation and something that's correct. So this is the assignment, how the assignments should look. And of course, I hope this font is big enough here. We are really, this is something that's been a big concern for us because we really, you know, we, it's very key that people use these more sort of complete databases as they come out. And, and this is sort of now happening. 
So assignment to an incomplete database really does lead to wrong conclusions about SHM and antibody evolution. But I think everybody here are on the same page about that. Um, so um, moving on, we have tried to make everything very available. And this is an open source code, as you know. And we keep adding information to the home page. And you can find it there. Um, there is We're continuously updating this. So if you have any questions, you should. Uh, be in contact. Um, so I'm going to leave the macaques for a moment and then come back to them because I want to focus on humans for a while. Uh, but I've tried to use this little symbol so you know what species I'm talking about. So now humans, we were interested in understanding human genetic diversity because it's very obvious as well that ID Discover is a, is a useful tool for this. And we can go through more and uh, quite a few individuals relatively rapidly. So. We, um, we knew, we know that there is diversity uh, still to be discovered in humans. And we started looking at that. And some, we had looked at it in the published paper in a couple of people and identified a few new alleles already by sequencing a few individuals. So we expanded that and looked in this case here, uh, just four individuals uh, of Caucasian background. And here you can see what we typically find if we sequence people, uh, sort of Europeans of Caucasian background, we find anything between one to three new alleles in each person. So this is sort of quite typical to what we would find. And, and many of these alleles are, are being validated now as we sort of, as we do this work. We also around this time reached out to, to Kathy uh, Skippers and Lynn Morris because they had published this very interesting paper about human VD in diversity in the South African Zulu population in, in the Caprisa cohort. And, we thought this was extremely interesting and, and also a, a good opportunity to sort of apply ID Discover because to do this work uh, using genomic uh, sequencing is, is very, um, it's hard work. It's, it's, it, it takes a lot of time and especially if you want to cover your lambda and kappa chains as well. So uh, we started a collaboration and I think it's, it's really turning out to, to be, uh, there's a lot of interesting data coming out and Kathy showed at her poster earlier today at lunchtime, some of the data. And this is sort of very much ongoing. And many of the alleles that Kathy described in this first paper, we have now independently validated by using ID Discover. So that's sort of a, a two totally independent method to, to saying that these alleles are right. And here we looked at four of these individuals. And again, I'm showing this sort of exactly the same way I show the other trees. But here you can see in each individual, we find many more new alleles consistent with what Kathy had reported. So you can see we find anything between six to nine new alleles per person. And in the output from ID Discover, you always have this little extension to the name. And so you see the long names there on the new alleles. So validation is really, really important. And this is, of course, what we are spending our time doing in addition to sort of the bio biology. Uh, these are four points just showing how we validate. And one is, of course, that we can make IDM libraries from different time points from the same individual. Or if we're working with macaques, we can use different tissues like bone marrow, blood, lymph nodes, spleen. We make different IDM libraries. And when we do that, the same individual always gives the same output. Um, other ways to validate is to look at uh, whether you find a new allele in multiple subjects. And then there's, of course, targeted genomic sequencing. And we're doing a lot of that because that's um, still, I think, needed and still important to do for a while more. Then we have also started to use the fact that some individuals are heterozygotes for J segments as another way to validate, which we call validation through inferred haplotype analysis. And I'm going to show you how that looks and what we, how we interpret that uh, in the next couple of slides. So if you have individuals that are heterozygotes for, for, for a J segment, for example, and this is very much uh, uh, coming from discussions with Mats and ideas he had and had already published in his paper earlier this year, that you can use uh, this information to look at which V allele is associated with which J in your output because we sequence the full expressed VDJs. So, so that's the basic idea, but I'm going to show you sort of how it looks. And we refer to this method as IHAP. And this, for the Americans, is not the International House of Pancakes. It's, it's our validation method. So this is what it looks like. If you're homozygote, I've divided this up on, on a couple of different slides. These are just the genes that this individual are, is homozygote for. You can see that uh, a given one allele segregates 
or very equally between the two J's. So here the, the J602 is on the blue chromosome and O3 is on the green. And you get, you know, the high expressed alleles are high expressed uh, and, and the low are low. And it looks very much like they divide up half and half between the J's. So allele A and B are the same in this case. If you're a heterozygote for a gene, you will look like this. So here, they say it's kind of the opposite. Here, they come down only with one J, so either with O2 or with O3. And it's really clear for the highly expressed genes and a little bit less clear for the really low ones, of course, because you have fewer sequencing reads to look at. But you can see that in all cases, it segregates quite clearly between uh, the two Js. So this is... Um, homozygotes and heterozygotes. And then we can additionally see if somebody's deleted. And here you can see that this individual has nothing on the two, uh, on, on one of the chromosomes. There is only one allele that's coming down with either O2 or O3. Uh, but there's, there's not two alleles to be found for some genes. So this suggests heterozygote deletions. Uh, and Sort of uh, the additional information one can find is that some alleles, you find three, you find two that come down with one of the Js, suggesting there's two uh, on one chromosome and one on the other in this case. And this is VH169. Uh, and there are quite a few. Uh, I see there's a little mislabel there. This is 169, but there's 01, 02, and 06. And this is really not unusual. This particular gene has a lot of duplications, and that's been described by others here before. So we, we can see this quite clearly by this IHAP analysis. Um, so if you look at the full analysis of a, of a person here annotated and shown, you can, see, you can see the homozygote alleles of this person. You can see the heterozygote. You can see the new alleles indicated by the red asterisks. You can see the deleted one uh, that are indicated um, as well. Um, that's... Sorry, the deletion are the, are the red asterisks and the blue are the, the new alleles. Uh, and then the, the duplication there for BH169. So this is sort of how it can look in one person. So there's quite a lot of information you can get by just looking at your NDS data uh, with this IHAP analysis module, which is now being added to RG Discover. Another example uh, is another person here, uh, and here, this was also actually that something that came up in discussions with Matsolin. He had noted that this particular individual had a lot of heterozygote alleles uh, that were lacking on, on chromosome, uh, on, on one of the chromosomes, O3. So you can see that there is a stretch of, of uh, alleles that are only present on the blue chromosome. And in this case, we place them in order, the way they appear on the chromosome because we suspected that was a bigger deletion. And if you do that, you can see that there is quite clearly, a well, it's a suggestive of a deletion over this region, and it's quite a large deletion. Uh, but it's, they are next to each other, all these deleted alleles. So it's suggestive of a deletion, so that can be confirmed. In addition, this person has two new alleles, as you can see there by the asterisks. So, so that's what we can, uh, the kind of information we can get with this IHAP mo module. The other thing we can use it for is to validate new alleles, because if they segregate very clearly with one of the Js, again, we can only do this when we have individuals that are heterozygous for J segments. Um, and perhaps you could do the same when we, have, when we can use uh, D heterozygosity. We're using it for Js right now. So here, the say, a, a person that has a new allele, a new VH320 allele, uh, and it's only present on one chromosome. And on the other chromosome is the a known allele. And when I say known, I mean it's present in IMDT. So that is very suggestive of that it's real, because the, otherwise the reads would kind of appear on both randomly. We have, for this particular allele, also done genomic targeting, uh, targeted PCR and Sanger sequencing, and, and confirmed it. So this has been validated by two different ways. And actually, by three, because we find it repeatedly in many individuals. Uh, we found it in a total of 31 persons from 66 libraries that we have analyzed, 66 individuals. So that's quite, it's, it's not infrequent. Uh, it's, a, it's a low expressed gene, so it's, uh, it's not immediately obvious, perhaps depending on which method you use. But we find it quite clearly. 
So having sort of spent a lot of time validate, and, and we still do that, I think is everyone, we validate, uh, but at the same time, we also um, ask additional questions. And what we wanted to do was to look at other ethnicities. So I showed you the data from Europeans and South Africans. And in addition, we um, have looked at a number of individuals from far from East Asia, from South Asia, uh, and some other African individuals from other parts of Africa. And South America, I don't have that on the slide, but we have, what I'm gonna show you here is these groups of persons. So if we look at the non-South African Africans, they are like the South Africans, very, uh, they have a lot of, a lot of alleles that are not present in IMDT. So here you can see between nine and 12 novel alleles per person. Some of these are found in multiple people. Uh, so it's not, um, you know, this many in total, but in each person, that's how many you find. So that's, that's very clear that this has been understudied and that needs to be validated and needs to be in the databases. If you look at the East Asians, the picture is also quite clear. There's more new alleles than what we typically find in Europeans, but less than in Africans. But there's quite a, new, quite a few new alleles to be found. And if we look in South Asians, and this is... Uh, pretty much restricted to people from India, I think. This is um, uh, the same picture. Quite a few new alleles to be found. So, um, in sort of just to summarize the human diversity study part, we've analyzed 66 IDM libraries, of which we've made ourselves 40, from 40 volunteers. And uh, from that, we prepared ID Discover based uh, individualized databases. And we found in total 235 so far, com high confidence germline alleles. Um, of those, 114 were already, are already present in IMDT. So that's a way of validating them. In, so they are found repeatedly. Uh, but there's also a lot of new ones, 121 in total. And there's also quite a few alleles in IMDT that we have not found so far. So this is all sort of adds up as we keep sequencing more people. Uh, 46 of the new alleles were present in more than one individual, and 26 of the new alleles were present in more than three, uh, or at least three or more. And then we also looked at how many of those encode, have co coding differences from uh, other known alleles, and it's about, well, it's more than half, but some of them have silent mutations. So this, this is sort of, uh, I think, we will continue to, to increase the numbers a little bit, but it, it gives a pretty clear picture. Uh, so why is this important? And we think it's, it's, it's important for several reasons. And one is, of course, that we want to understand immunoglobulin genetics. We want to improve the databases. We want to understand what we start from when we study responses to vaccines and infections. Uh, we also, in particularly, as germline targeting vaccines are getting popular, and these, there are trials that are uh, about to start, it's important to know if the individuals that enter those trials actually have the allele that the vaccines have been designed to engage. And then, of course, perhaps the even bigger question is, you know, we, once this can be scaled up, could we use it to understand uh, predisposition to develop certain types of antibody-mediated diseases? So those kind of association studies, as Corey suggested in his talk, has, have not been done because there's no markers over these loci in the GWAS uh, chips. So uh, just one slide on the germline targeting vaccines. The one that's for the most sort of uh, far, furthest advanced is a trial uh, that's ongoing to try to re-elicit a broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV called VRC01. This, there's a whole bunch of antibodies of this class that have been isolated from different people. Uh, so it's thought to be something that one could perhaps re-elicit by using multiple uh, prime boost regimens. And the prime would be to expand these uh, precursors, these rare precursor B cells that have the VH1-202 allele coupled with uh, a light chain that has uh, only five amino acid residue. These antibodies then have to be extensively mutated before they gain broadly neutralizing antibody activity, but it's the beginning to try to engage those types of antibodies. And the critical, this antibody has been studied in great detail, and there's the critical residues are known to be outside of the CDR3, uh, there's three particular an residues that are present in the VH1-2 allele that are in, in the CDR2 region and in framework 3. Uh, and this, the trial that's about to start is uh, 
run by Bill Schief, uh, and many, many people are involved. Um, and the idea is to realize these sort of antibodies. And, and our contribution to this trial will be to use ID Discover to sequence the trial participants to know if they have the specific allele or not, as that is an important starting point. And that's just showing where the motif is. And there is currently five-ish 102 alleles in IMDT. We found an additional a few, uh, about four, I think, in total. Some of them are shown here, and some of them do not have the motif. So that's important to know. And we've even found, I think, you know, the names, uh, this is not the final nomenclature here, but one of them is identical to the PO6 allele that has been discussed in this group. And the, uh, we have found individuals that are homozygote for that allele. So those would be people that would be predicted to not respond to this type of vaccine. And that's important to know. So then moving back to macaque regions for a moment. Uh, rhesus macaques are commonly used uh, for uh, uh, vaccine studies and, and other studies of disease. In the US, people tend to use Indian origin macaques. There's been an export ban from, from uh, India uh, a long time ago, many decades ago. So these animals are bred here, uh, and the ten US researchers tend to use Indian origin dried macaques. Whereas in other parts of the world, people tend to use Chinese dried rhesus macaques. And in some primate facility, uh, cynomologous macaques are used. Uh, in particular, there's been an interest in monkeys from Mauritius because they are a little bit less outbred, um, and that's known from their MHC um, haplotypes. So how different are all these um, macaques from each other, and, and can we generate a useful database from these? This is just sort of summarizing uh, we have sequenced about 20, both Chinese origin and Indian origin macaques by now. Um, we can see that there are alleles that overlap, so they are definitely not so different from each other, but there, there are some differences. Um, currently, I mentioned this before, IMDT has only a subset of these. We have a database that is still so far unpublished, and there are other people who have other databases. Uh, the, pay, the very nice presentation yesterday we heard about um, from uh, Tom Kepler and, and uh, the VRC, uh, that was basically a, another effort to, to generate a good database for rhesus macaques. And uh, we have looked at the sequences, and approximately 20 alleles are identical with the ones in our database. But what it basically says is that this diversity is enormous, and I don't think that we can ever reach saturation. We need to have a way of generating individualized databases if we have a particular interest in following the response in a given animal. So this is what it looks like, just to give you an example, if you take five random macaques from the same facility, they overlap by two alleles. They're, you can see how many alleles are animal-specific. So they, they really are incredibly diverse. Um, and this is what we see over and over again. So even if we seek us 10 more monkeys, we, you know, we still will look like this. There's very little overlap between them. OK, we also used this IHAP analysis method to for macaques, and you can see here that they tend to be quite heterozygote. Uh, it's particularly J5 in monkeys that, that you can find a lot of animals that are heterozygote for J5. Uh, so this is also additional information and validation. So, uh, and a, a sort of a couple of slides on the Mauritius sinos. We are engaged in an EU project where vaccine um, trials are being done in animals from this island. And they're sort of interesting because they have a, a defined uh, history. There were only 20 animals that came to the island about 400 years ago, and that's been recorded. So we sort of know that this was a relatively small founder colony, uh, but there's now 40,000 animals on the island. But they are, uh, they have more limited MHC diversity that was known, but basically nothing was known about antibody V-gene diversity. So uh, as part of this EU project, we were asked to sequence six rhesus macaques and six synelmogus as it's in homologous um, macaques from Mauritius. Uh, around this time, one paper came out on synomologous macaque uh, heavy, heavy chain um, V genes. And this is very useful and helpful, uh, but it's only talking about the heavy chain and not the lambda and kappa. Uh, there's also no sequence information about the upstream leader sequences, so people cannot use these, uh, this database for designing primers for cloning antibodies, for example. So there's still a lot of work needed. Um, but so when we when we sequenced these six plus six, we see that uh, the sinus are indeed more 
similar to each other than rhesus typically are. But there is otherwise generally sort of the same VH families are, are they're kind of equal in proportion to each other, etc. So just by Venn diagram, it looks like this again. These six, these are different from the ones I showed before, but these rhesus macaques we have one overlapping allele, whereas the Mauritius sinos have 16 overlapping alleles. So they are they are a little bit more similar to each other, but there's still a big diversity. Um, and then we looked at if there's similar alleles in the sinos with the rhesus, and we find approximately 20% of the allele are actually overlapping. So these are they're not entirely different from each other, but but the but the main message is that they are the diversity is, is very high. So we have used ID Discover for, for these the species I talked about, humans, uh, macaques, and mice, but we've also applied it to guinea pigs and generated a, a VGene database for guinea pigs. Rabbits uh, has only been started, and I know that Martin has analyzed a bat library from Andrew Collins and zebrafish library that was available as well. So it works in multiple species, and that's one of our sort of advantages. We're using it also as a tool for just sort of uh, basic antibody repertoire profiling, and we're just... Uh, in the last year, added a clonotyping and lineage analysis module to the program. So that's sort of on, uh, ongoing work that we're using in our, our own vaccine studies. So to summarize, ID Discover allows construction of individualized databases. Um, and that, in turn, has revealed all this diversity, both at the allelic level and the structural diversity. Like I mentioned, we can identify potential or likely deletions and duplications in the loci. And we can use the IHAP module to validate novel alleles. Uh, and I think I, I think this audience are all you know, on the same page about how Im how important it is to understand the sort of the basis of antibody genetics and their role in various settings of of, uh, of disease, health and disease. So I think with that, I'd like to just uh, thank my group, uh, particularly Martin, Ganesh, and Nestor, who have worked a lot with ID Discover together with our computational scientist, Marcel Martin. And there's a multi many other people in the lab that have contributed to the data that I showed today, Monica, Sanjana, Pradeepa, and Paula. Uh, and then we have a nice dialogue with Matsulin in Lund and a collaboration with Kathy and Lynn in Johannesburg. Uh, for the macaque work, uh, that's actually being done under an NIH-funded HIVRAD grant. And, and the work I showed you about this Mauritius Sinos is under an EU grant together with scientists in Paris. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so uh, how much of a problem, if any, is false positives? Is, is discovery something that you could encourage non-experts to use as part of their normal repertoire analysis, or is it something that needs very careful evaluation? Well, I think at this point, I mean, we've been, we've been taking the more kind of stringent, the more careful approach to this. So that's, you know, part of, of the algorithm is to really, you know, rule out that. Uh, it's, so I think that, you know, that's been our highest priority to rule out false positives. And I think we, that means that we may miss some things, but we prefer that at this stage. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, I think it should be useful. I mean, it should be fairly, you know, easy to use for anyone who's downloading the program and has an IGM library. So I want to ask the opposite question. Do you have any idea about false negatives? <laughs> so in other words, like when I know that, for example, Martin yesterday mentioned that you guys have done PCR validations and you confirm a lot of the positive findings, but when doing those PCR validations, are you also coming across alleles that you didn't see in the repertoire? Um, by, we, by genomic, targeted genomic yeah, studies. If I we're mean, finding a lot that we didn't find with ID Discover, no, not really, but I can't, I shouldn't, we have not done enough to answer that comprehensively, probably, of that. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's, you know, that's the work ahead for sure. We, we need to do both for a while. Um, but we're very confident, I think, that we're picking up, you know, even pretty low. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I agree. I think it's, um, I mean, especially if you're thinking about disease association analysis, false positives are, I mean, false negatives are still a real problem. Right. Uh, because a genotype is potentially two alleles, right? If you if you only see one allele of heterozygote, then you can't do disease association studies very 
very well anyway. Yeah, I mean, it would be really nice to, you know, to spend some time for you know validating these yeah i get it so i understand it's hard slash time consuming slash not fun but necessary yeah so i'm still trying to get my head wrapped around the uh, ihap mm -hmm. and the sort of distances that you're working from uh, the v segments down to the j's and i'm wondering if it's not possible or have you thought about trying to use that information to understand um, the evolution of a new haplotype. So it's not stagnant, right? And I mean, if you had a novel haplotype, could you go back to the mother and father and yes. mothers and sisters? We, 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 yeah, we really sort of see if, you know, did, is that a de novo haplotype? Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, we haven't specifically looked for those. We have a, we have a few family members in our volunteers. Uh, and that's already, you know, confirmed. It's it's been very clear in the, in the in the cases that we've looked at. You can see exactly, you know, if something comes from which parent it comes from. But it's not something we've yet, you know, collected enough examples of. But I think it would be very interesting. Yeah. Hi, um, wonderful talk. Um, in 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 the um, NHP uh, centers we have, we have really well established deep cohorts of animals, and so. Um, could you combine IHAP and iDiscover to sort of accelerate or get even greater confidence if you know you've got a familial structure and you can actually derive the haplotypes and the... And I think that's a really good example of, of what one could do. Yes, what one should do. Because we've only really applied it to, you know, humans. We had, and only recently we have found the time to apply that to the monkeys. But I think, it, you know, it works the same way, of course. So it's if you have those kinds of cohorts, it's definitely interesting uh, and should be done, I think, yeah. Really nice talk, Anila. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, so, uh, so out of your high-quality IgM reads, what, per what percentage of them would you say uh, you can account for uh, with, a, with a germline gene? And as I'm just kind of based on what Corey's saying and just, you know, anybody else that's doing this, I'm just wondering what kind of numbers... Um, you know, you get it like what's left over that you can't really account for. Is it like 10%, 1%? Martin, would you know? I, I, I don't, yeah, you can ask. Oh, there you are. <laughs> you want to say it? If, if you're asking a question about getting the full genotype and how many we would actually miss. No, with... what I mean by that. Let's go with you. It's just, okay, so you've got all your IgM good reads that you trust. And so what percentage of those can you say, oh, yeah, that goes with this germline gene or it's likely to, because, you know, there's sequencing errors and stuff. And how much do you have left over that you're just like, well, I don't really know what to do with those? Is it zero? Like, how much leftover stuff is there? Well, we discard some sequences, but would we... Well, that's what I'm saying. What yeah. percentage is discarded? Like, the Yeah, well, in, in our current analysis, we use uh, barcodes, and we we filter down to 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 single sequences, but uh, we don't discard singlets in our analysis because we we realize that quite a high proportion of the singlets do have the exact correct sequence on it, and if we if we discard all the singlets then we will lose the very low expressed sequences. So that, that's our method for actually getting the low expressed sequences. So we do uh, UMI barcode analysis. Um, <laughs> so, so maybe I can contribute towards this, I get, uh, I don't know if it will help. So um, from the, so, so from, yeah, so from the Caprice samples that we've run through this, it's on average about um, 500,000 unique antibodies that we're, we're getting results from, if that helps. So it's a, it is a proportion of the repertoire, I guess, but it's a representative of at least 500,000 unique antibodies. Still not helpful. <laughs> Well, we identify we identify a lot of candidate sequences, and yeah, we're we're probably discarding about ninety percent of those candidate sequences. Okay, so. Okay. 
Okay. I think at this, you know, we we had to start with stringent. You know, that was our goal a bit. Yeah. No. Yeah. Hmm. Andrew. Martin mentioned yesterday that you do um, you you have been exploring the inference of D genes as well, and we over the years we have inferred two human um, D polymorphisms. So I guess I'm I'm keen to see uh, that process begin. Is there anything more you can tell us? Um, I, uh, I, I had I know some slides on Jade. Have you seen more? Since yeah, J's we could have shown, but you know there wasn't time. But D's, you know, are a little bit behind. Uh, Adam, do you want to add something on the D's? We don't have the D um, discovery built into the pipeline at the moment. We have it as a separate script, but it will be integrated very soon. Uh, what I will say is that novel D's are not that common. So if you're looking for D's and you're finding them in everyone you test something is going wrong with your analysis. So they're, they're not very common. But we do find them on the same ones in, in several individuals fr from several different ethnic groups as well. So. I'm curious about the, um, the value about adding the, the sort of haplotype test on the in, inferred novel alleles. So have you looked at cases of where Things have been false positives from, say, the the first sort of IG discovery step, and then you could find that by the haplotype analysis. Could I, I would expect, for example, things that were introduced by sequencing error, you might expect would randomly associate with with both chromosomes, but an error that was in, induced, say, by some kind of uh, some kind of clonal expansion, you would still expect, you know, that kind of uh, uh, error to associate with just a single chromosome. So the haplotype analysis wouldn't necessarily pick that up. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Martin. I think I see. I see you're sitting there, like you want to answer. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, when, when we look for the number of unique CDR3s which are associated with sequence, it tends to to remove all the the PCR artifacts from it. So, so we're looking for evidence of multiple rearrangements. So, you know, a single PCR expansion doesn't tend to to show that type of evidence. Um. Hey, Stan, man.
Well, it's time to get started again. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our last speaker for this evening before uh, the discussion of um, governors uh, of uh, AIR later on. And uh, it's uh, Ludwig Solid from Oslo. And he's going to talk about antibody response to celiac disease. And uh, looking forward to the talk. Thank you, George. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me over from Oslo to tell that results we have generated in our group studying um, celiac disease. Some food for thought. Um, this is a condition which is caused by a harmful immune response to serial proteins, and it's a heritable disorder. The concordance rate in monozygotic twins is 75%. We've known for many years that there is a strong HLA association to the HLA DQ2 and DQ8 allotypes. And on gluten consumption, these patients have serum IgA and IgG antibodies to deamidated gluten peptides. I will come back to what that is, which often is abbreviated DGP and transglutaminase 2, which is an autoantigen. And over the last 50 years, this disease has moved from the camp of food hypersensitivity disorder to um, autoimmunity. The pediatricians earlier did elimination provocation diets to make the, diet, the diagnosis, and now they diagnose it by blood test um, detecting antibodies to transglutaminase 2. And this enzyme, transglutaminase 2, is a an ubiquitous enzyme found in all over the body, um, and it's known for building extracellular matrix. So it has the ability to cross-link proteins or polypeptides with glutamine, and in presence of calcium, um, there is formation of an enzyme substrate intermediate, which can react with primary amines, which can be a lysine or another polypeptide, and then you get this cross-link, this um, formation of, of um, isopeptide-bonded polypeptides. It can also react with water, and then you convert the glutamine to a glutamate, and that is really essential in celiac disease, and this process is called um, dehamidation. So celiac disease has, as many other diseases, been subjected to genome-wide association studies. And um, the, this is a Manhattan plot showing um, the P minus uh, log 10 values. And what really is striking is the HLA on chromosome 6. Um, it has an effect size which completely outnumbers the effect size of all other non-HLA loci. And in celiac disease, we know what the HLA genes do. Um, they present gluten peptides to T cells, and it is the disease-associated DQ2 and DQ8 allotypes that do so. And the peptides which are presented to these CD4 T cells, they come from gluten, which are resistant to proteolysis. They somehow get across the epithelium, and then they are modified by transglutaminase 2. We don't know exactly where that happens. And we believe that there are antigen-presenting cells which then pick up these peptides and present them to these CD4 T cells, which produce cytokines, and which I consider as the director of the immunological orchestra. And when the patients eat gluten, they get symptoms um, and they get sick. So this is a lifelong condition caused by a hypersensitivity to gluten. And when we started studying these cells in the gut, we realized we got hold of these T cells by studying what now is called tissue resident T cells. And we can use tetramers and find that the T cells in the biopsy has a frequency of maybe 1% to 2% of the CD4 cells. And using the same tetramers, we see that in blood, the frequency is at least thousandfold less. So we would not have been able to get hold of these T cells if we were to study them in blood. And they are effector memory T cells. And these anti-transglutaminase 2 antibodies, they are formed in a gluten-dependent manner. When the patients stop eating gluten, which is the treatment, these antibodies disappear. And when they are challenged, the antibodies reappear. And they only occur in individuals who express these DQ2 and DQ8 HLA types. And how to explain that? And we believe that 
complexes of gluten, peptide, and transglutamase are really essential to explain that. And they can be formed in two ways. They can either be the um, pyroester bond, the enzyme substru substrate intermediate, or it could be isopeptide bonded linkage to the surface lysine residues. But if you have a transglutaminase specific B cell, and you have these complexes of gluten and transglutaminase up on endocytosis and loading of your HLA molecules, it can be a gluten peptide that is presented to the T cell. So the immune system will be fooled so that the gluten specific T cell thinks it makes help to a gluten specific T cell. This could explain the gluten dependence. And it would also explain the HLA dependence because these gluten reactive T cells recognize gluten peptides in the context of the DQ2 and DQ8 molecules. So when you have gluten peptides in the presence of transglutaminase, at least in the test tube, you generate these deamidated peptides and you also generate these gluten peptide complexes. And as I told you, we believe that there are, this could be a way by which the transglutaminase specific B cell can get help from a gluten specific T cell. And you get formation of these antibodies, transglutaminase antibodies. But of course, there could be B cells which are specific for deamidated gluten peptides, which can present the same peptides to the T cells. And then um, you get a formation of anti deamidated gliadin antibodies. And I think the fact that these T cells, which I consider as the director of the immunological orchestra, directly can dictate whether you make the transglutaminase antibodies and the anti deamidated gliadin antibodies is the reason why these are such extremely good proxies for the disease. Um, so this T cell B cell interaction results in formation of effector B cells, plasma cells, but it also leads to amplification of the T cell response. Um, and I think the problem for these patients is when they have clonal expansion of gluten reactive T cells. And I think the B cells are key to um, facilitate that. And maybe the antibodies are just a marker of this process. So this is a section from a gut of a patient with active celiac disease. There is villous atrophy. You have a lot of T cells in the epithelium. You have some uh, T cells in the lamina propria. But what is really dominating here is plasma cells, enormous amount of plasma cells. And as I will tell you, many of these produce antibodies to transglutaminase and to deamidated gluten peptides. And we started getting interested in these antibodies and wanted to get hold of authentic antibodies. And through a convoluted route, we started to study these plasma cells. And what we realized is that IgA and IgM plasma cells express surface immunoglobulin. And that allowed us to uh, isolate antigen-specific plasma cells, both the transglutaminase-specific and the anti-deamidated gliadin peptide-specific plasma cells. And we had a initiated the collaboration with Patrick Wilson in Chicago, who's a world expert in expression, expression cloning of antibodies. So we got hold of panels of monoclonal antibodies specific for transglutaminase and for deamidated gliadin peptides coming from the patients. And this is some of the earlier experiments that Roberto De Niro did, um, where he stained plasma cells from patients with active celiac disease, a healthy donor, or celiac patients on a gluten-free diet. And he stained with this transglutaminase tetramer. Um, and he stained with I, uh, plasma cells, and this is also stained with IgA. And you can see that 8% of this person's plasma cells are, uh, IgA plasma cells are specific for transglutaminase, and there are some IgM-specific plasma cells. We don't see IgG-specific plasma cells at all in the gut, specific for transglutaminase. You don't see them in healthy donors, and you see a few in patients on a gluten-free diet. On, on average, 10% of the plasma cells in the lesion are specific for transglutaminase. So the immune system of these patients really want to get rid of transglutaminase. The number of plasma cells which are specific for the deamidated gliadin peptides are fewer. And here I show an experiment done by Eivind Steinspe, where he has stained with two peptides. This peptide here is an immunodominant B cell epitope. And this is a, a, a peptide that also contains B cell epitopes. And you can see there are fewer cells staining with these peptides than it is with 
which would stain with the transglutaminase antigen. And this, we get the same results if we do early spot and then test against the whole gluten um, mixture. Why that is so, we don't know. We have done single cell sequencing of cells, and, and um, this is results from, an, from experiments done by Bishnu Roy. He um, did single cell sorting of, of transglutaminase specific plasma cells and non transglutaminase specific plasma cells from 10 people, 10 patients. Um, um, and you can see there is certain combination of heavy and light chains which are overrepresented among the transglutaminase specific plasma cells, in particular this. HB551 KV15, which is fairly rare in, in, the, in the normal population, which is highly enriched in the transglutaminase specific. And also for the anti deamidated gliadin peptide plasma cells, although we have studied fewer, there seems to be a strong um, selection for certain heavy and light chain combinations. And I will come back to these antibodies towards the end of my talk. So the antigen are, the gluten antigen and the transglutaminase are very different. So transglutaminase is uh, an enzyme and the antibodies are detecting conformational dependent epitopes and they are located in the N-terminal part of the epitopes and we have mapped so far three major epitopes which accounts for most of the plasma cell reactivities. Um, these are gliadin peptides and you can see they have a lot of glutamine and proline uh, and here is the sequence of uh, the epitope, which is recognized by many of the monoclonal antibodies. And you can see that it's represented multiple times in long fragments of gluten peptides. So this is a multivalent antigen. And as I will get back to towards the end of my talk, we think that multivalency maybe is important. And maybe that is a way by this, how these antigens can actually for the immune system be more similar than what they look at face value. And these um, B -cell, this B cell epitope in one typical gliadin protein is found multiple times. And this protein is found 11 times. And here I've also color coded T cell epitopes we have identified. And you can see that they're often overlapping. And in these fragments, you would have multiple B cell epitopes, typically with T cell epitopes. Um, the serum antibodies are, as I told you, extremely good proxies for the disease. However, when we stain transglutaminase-specific plasma cells in the lesion, or we detect them by early spot, there is a very poor correlation between the, the levels of antibodies in serum and the number of plasma cells in the biopsy. So this raises the question, what is the relationship between gut and serum antibodies? And I have to admit that I've written reviews where I have stated that the antibodies you see in the blood are just spilling over from antibodies produced in the gut mucosa. Uh, I will tell you that that is probably not true. So th this work has been done by Rasmus Sivishn, an extremely clever postdoc in the group, and he has been inspired by George's uh, um, work, and I also have borrowed his slide. I've taken it from a publication, though, not from a grant application. Um, and what Rasmus has done is to purify antibodies from blood both IgA and IgG, and he's purified um, antibodies from gut biopsy secretions, from gut, um, gut explants. And he, we have sorted gut plasma cells, and then he has compared the V-gene usage um, in the mucosa with blood, and also looked for clonotype relationship using the CDR3, H3 derived peptides. And looking at the V-gene uh, usage. Um, um, there is um, overrepresentation of certain VGN segments, both in the serum IJ. Uh, this is then transglutaminase specific antibodies, which have been compared with non transglutaminase specific antibodies. And this is shown in the volcano plot. So you see that these blue here are those which are overrepresented in the transglutaminase specific antibodies. And you also see that there is an overrepresentation of certain VGN. Uh, in the in the biopsy derived IgA, and the distribution of the V genes are similar in the V genes which comes from next generation sequencing of the antigen specific plasma cells, as we find in the serum IgA and in the biopsy derived IgA. 
suggesting that that uh, that these um, the antibodies in serum and antibodies in the biopsy is using the same V genes, and then using um, mapping of clonotypes with the CDR3 H3 derived peptides. And here we have, uh, Rosmus has depicted uh, the clonotypes based on the next generation sequencing and, the, and they have ranked. So this is the one which has the most reads. And then looked for um, um, CDR3, H3 peptides, which map to these um, plasma cell derived sequences. And you can see that there are sequences which map from the serum IgA and the biopsy IgA, and they seem to map to the same clonotypes. Our results are very similar to George's results in that there are a few um, antibodies that seem to dominate the response. And it is uh, not necessary, I mean, it seems maybe there is a tendency that those which are in the higher rank produce more than those in the lower rank, but there is also some clones which are not really um, in the higher rank, which gives rise to antibodies both in serum and in the, in the biopsy. And then looking for how many of the sequences which can we map uh, it's um, um, both in from the serum IGA and the biopsy IGA there is a, uh, a, is more sequences which maps to the antitransglutaminase antibodies than the the flow through for the antibody affinity purification um, suggesting that the antibodies we pick is indeed specific and you see that both um, um, the picture is similar both for serum and for biopsy IGA and then looking at IgG it seems to be less, um, which we can map back to the, from the from the de novo sequenced IgG sequences, um, which either suggests that there are antibodies, the IgG antibodies, which are generated independent of the IgA antibodies, but it could also be that if there is high mutation rate in the IgG antibodies, we will miss them because the mass of that fragment will be different and we will not detect it in the mass spec survey. And this, to address whether the transglutaminase-specific IgA is produced, uh, in serum is produced in the gut, Rasmus also looked at the composition of the IgA, and this is a Western blot detecting dimeric and monomeric IgA. And this is total serum IgA, total biopsy IgA. This is the specific antibodies from serum and from biopsy. And you can see that most of the biopsy-derived IgA is dimeric, the serum-derived IgA is uh, monomeric, and there seems to be similar picture from the specific and the total IgA. And Erasmus also looked at this with mass spectrometry, looking for peptides which comes from the J-chain over peptide that comes from the total IgA. And this is done in a max quant quantitative uh, mass spectrometry. So by looking at the peptide intensities of the extracted ion chromatograms, you can get an idea how much you have. And here you have uh, antitransglutaminase serum IgA, the flow through from the affinity purification. This is antitransglutaminase biopsy IgA, and then the flow through from the affinity purification. And you can see that there is way more J chain in the biopsy derived uh, antibodies than from the serum. Um, and and uh, um, uh, this also goes for the, for the um, specific antibodies. So serum IgA have lower levels of J chain than the gut biopsy IgA. And then looking for the distribution of IgA1 and IgA2, um, there is a difference between the serum IgA and the biopsy IgA, both for the, for the total and the specific. Uh, and it seems that this, the uh, specific antitransglutaminase serum IgA is solely of the IgG, IgA1 isotype. So the composition of the IgA even though they have clone relatedness, are different. So um, serum IgA, anti-IgA, anti-TG2 IgA antibodies and gut um, anti-TG2 IgA have the same regions and the same CDR3H3 regions. But serum IgA is monomeric, gut IgA is mostly dimeric. And serum but not gut anti-TG2 IgA is exclusively IgA1. So they are likely derived from the same base cells but they are pro different, produced by different sets of plasma cells. Same origin, but produced by different plasma cells. And some B cell clones give rise both to IgA and IgG plasma cells, yet the majority of the IgG antibodies seem to be produced by a separate plasma cell population. And 
this could possibly be because you have B-cell activation outside of the gut, and, and it's hard to, to address that in humans. So I think for the time being, it has to remain as, an, as a possibility. Then I would like to tell you about recognition of post-translation in modified gluten peptides. And this is work done by Omri Schneer, a postdoc in the group, and Xi Chen, who was a crystallographer in our group, who is now back in China. And, and uh, we also collaborated with uh, Guriari and Moria Guidoni on this project, on the, on the repertoires, which I will not tell you much about. But this is then um, bulk sequencing, high throughput sequencing. And here is the frequency of the different B genes. Um, and there is this preponderance of VH315 and 323, which we also have observed in the single cell data, when these plasma cells have been sorted with this immunodominant peptide. And uh, in the antibodies from the single cell data, which um, recognize this peptide, there is a preponderance of this uh, IgHB323 and um, Lambda469 and 315 and Kappa 4, 1. And both of the antibodies were selected with a deamidated peptide. This antibody is only recognizing the deamidated peptide, not the native version. Whereas this antibody here is recognizing both the native and the deamidated version of the peptide. Omri did an alanin scan to look for which residues in this peptide are important for recognition. And you can see that for this peptide here, it is the region surrounding this glutamate in position five, which is central. Whereas for this antibody here, it's not really caring about the, this position here. It's more the flanking residues, which are important, uh, both on the N-terminal part and the C-terminal part. And to try to understand this better, we solve the crystal structure of these peptide antibody complexes. And the peptides dog very differently to the antibodies. Um, so they are outstretched, but they are docking very differently to the, to the antibody. And also in terms of binding, they use very different principles for binding. This peptide here is having side chains which dock into pockets of the binding site. There is one pocket accommodating the glutamine in position three, and there is one pocket accommodating the phenylalanine in position eight and the proline in position nine. This interface here is very flat, very little interaction of the side chains. However, there is an, uh, a salt bridge between an arginine in the antibody uh, and the glutamate in position five. So this recognition of the deamidated peptide, uh, the deamidated residue is really critical for binding for this antibody. So these two antibodies recognize the peptide differently, yet I think they are operating around the same um, um, principle and that the net effect will be the same. And, and this relates to the specificity of transglutaminase. This is taken from work by Fritz Koning's group, which looked at the sequence specificity of the enzyme using um, um, variants of gluten peptides. And he found that the sequence QXP was a good substrate. QXX, when you have a bulky hydrophobic residue, was a good substrate. And QXP and bulky hydrophobic was a good substrate. And Burkhard Fleckenstein, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, also investigated this with a peptide library. And he made this peptide and varied all the positions uh, surrounding the glutamine. And he found impact of residues in position minus one, in plus one, plus two, and plus three. And in particular, this position plus two with the proline was critical for recognition. And looking for the specificity, this uh, recognition uh, specificity of the enzyme, aligned to this um, B-cell epitope, this is a residue which is uh, converted to glutamate. And what the enzyme is recognizing is then the, the flanking residues, and particularly this proline here. And looking at how the antibodies recognize it, this antibody here, this 1EO3, is recognizing the product of the enzymatic reaction. This antibody here is recognizing the sequence which the, en the enzyme is using to recognize its substrate. And what would this mean? This, these two B cells, which have specificity either for the glutamate or for the recognition sequence, they could both bind these peptide, which has the B cell epitope and which has a neighboring T cell epitope. And then you can present the gluten, the deamidated T cell epitope to the T cell. 
So both antibodies recognize signatures of transglutaminase processing. One recognizes the glutamate, the other one recognizes what the enzyme is recognizing. And I think in, 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 in vivo, this will both lead to, this t both these T cells would get T cell help, which is really critical for whether you make the antibodies. So one thing we have observed with our antibodies, which we don't understand, and with the plasma cells, which we don't understand, is that they have somatic mutations and they have few. And it, this goes both for the transglutaminase-specific plasma cells, but also for the deamidated gliadin-specific plasma cells. And here I've shown results from Bishnu's work on the single cells, where you can see that the lower level of mutation both goes for um, light chain and heavy chain. Why this is, we don't know. And I think we can only speculate, but there's one speculation I would like to share with you. And that is that this enzyme is an extremely good substrate also for itself. So if you incubate the enzyme in presence of calcium, you generate these multimers of the peptide. If you add a gluten peptide, which in this case has been with FITSI labeled, you see that the, it generates still the, the complexes. <laughs> And doing the fluorescent scanning, you see that the gluten peptides are incorporated into the multimers. And what this would result in is a, an antigen which is decorated with gluten peptides, which then can be recognized by the, the, the B cell specific for the gliadin peptide. It can be recognized by the B cell specific for the transglutaminase. So for these B cells, this antigen here will essentially be the same even though the one is a, an antigen which is recognizing where you have conformational epitope and the other one is peptides which are linear. And we know that multivalent antigens tend to induce extra follicular responses, which usually have fewer mutations. So that is one of the working hypotheses we have for the time being. I would like to finish off by acknowledging the people involved. I mentioned the work of, by Rasmus Iversen on the on the proteomics. I mentioned the work of C. Chan and Omrish Nir on the gliadin specific antibodies. And there have been a number of people who have contributed over the years. And we've had this very fruitful collaboration with Patrick Wilson and also with uh, Guriari and, uh, and Sao in, in, in Oxford helped with the crystallography and, and Jose Kroll in Brazil helped with the, with the um, mass spectrometry interpretation. Um, so thank you for the attention. Fascinating talk, as always. A uh, couple of questions. Do you see, actually, uh, since you were telling us last night that uh, basically transglutaminase is associated with fibronectin in tissues, do you actually see the antibodies also decorating transglutaminase? In other words, could you have a lot of inflammation because of an uh, immune response to uh, antibodies deposited onto the extracellular matrix? Is that part of the disease? I'm not 100% sure whether I understand your question, but these antibodies, they um, react with transglutaminase in solution, but also in tissue. And the pediatrician, the clinicians, when they make the diagnosis earlier, they put the antibodies on tissue sections. And then the transglutaminase they were detecting is the transglutaminase, which is associated with extracellular matrix proteins. And um, um, until very recently, the, the, the belief has been that this interaction is solely determined by fibronectin. But one of our epitopes, one of the major epitopes, is actually uh, covering the fibronectin binding site. So these antibodies should not give tissue staining, but they do. And it's, um, uh, we have data to suggest that the binding is actually to another extracellular matrix protein, which is more important than binding to the fibronectin, and that the fibronectin binding site is actually exposed on these extracellular mm -hmm. translators. So you do not see antibodies deposited onto the tissues? Yes, in patients. In patients. Um, um, there is a Finnish group which claims that they do, and they also claim that this is a reason why many of the patients have extra intestinal symptoms, so they have systemic disease. Um, okay. And also, um, why do you have these cross-links in the presence of huge amounts of water, I mean, the amidation should be significantly favored kinetically, unless 
this very high effective concentration of yeah, well, that was exactly the question we were when we first came up with this idea that the enzyme could do deamidation. People said that this is an in vitro artifact. And I said that I don't really care. What my T cells are probing is the sequence which has become deamidated. So somehow in vivo, this happens. And the best explanation we have come up with is that if you lower the pH, the nucleophilic attack of the, of the lysine or the primary amine is much less, uh, much less um, yeah. Active. So you slow down the transamidation reaction, whereas the the, the um, deamidation reaction is the same. So you can have conditions where the, the rate of these two reactions are much more comparable, and pH seems to be a factor which dictates it. It's probably related to the pH of the lumen and, yeah. Probably. Um, so if have you looked in the same patient at the levels of somatic hypermutation within the IgA plasma cells in the blood versus the gut? Are there differences? I may have missed it. So uh, I'm not sure whether we, our data really allow us to compare the rate of mutations. Um, so we have done the mapping with the CDR3H3, so we don't really cover the, the degree of mutations in the, in the antibodies and serum, so that we don't know. What I can tell you is that they recognize the same epitopes and they from very crude kitchen type of kitchen chemistry type of experiment, they don't seem to have much higher affinity. But I don't know. Right. I'm just curious about the, the uh, and also like where where are they coming from them? So if if there are two different populations of plasma cells, then the memory B cells, where do you think they're being? So the so, so so also the serum antibodies disappear very quickly when the patients stop eating gluten. So they disappear within months suggesting that these plasma cells, which are not residing in the gut, where they, whether they are in bone marrow or spleen, they also have a relatively short uh, life. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a question. You've mentioned the extra-intestinal symptoms mm -hmm. that some of these patients have. Uh, and um, in, in recent years, people, clinicians have been more alert to, to searching for celiac disease and probably the majority of patients have not a, a, a intestinal dominating um, phenotype nowadays. So for, in terms of pathophysiology, so what do you think uh, these symptoms are coming from? Is that, um, has that to do with T cells wandering around or is that uh, antibody driven or what do you think about that? So I think the gut symptoms largely is dictated by activation of T cells. I mean, there is a possibility that you have antibody-mediated effects. And, and these symptoms come very early. So people that has been an argument to say that this must be complement-mediated or antibody-mediated. Um, but um, we have been working with Bob Anderson's group in Boston, uh, where we, they have, we have done challenge of patients um, and four hours after challenge of patients, you can detect IL-2 in the serum as coming as a peak, suggesting that um, very early you get T cell activation and cytokine release. And this, uh, this increase in cytokines coincide with the symptoms, the timing of the symptoms of the patients, like nausea and vomiting. When it comes to these extra-intestinal symptoms, like neurological symptoms, it could very well be that they, they are mediated by the antibodies. But I think that the, the gut symptoms, to a large extent, extent, is dictated by activation of T cells. And related to that, do you find the antigen that likely drives the B cell proliferation outside of the gut, do you find that systemically? So, in other words, are these are these, meet, these B cells meeting the antigen in the gut, or are these so, cells so, meeting the antigen? So, trans, speaking about transglutaminase then, or gluten peptides, which antigen are you to, uh, referring to? Well, um, probably both, but you know, with um, trans so, tr transglutaminase is expressed in every organ of the body. It's massively expressed in the thymus. It's produced on free ribosomes within the cell. It somehow it gets outside. It has a calcium activated form, which can do this cross-linking. Um, it's a big debate how much you actually see extracellularly. Uh, it could be that some of the, what we detect in this when we make these tissue sections are in vitro artifacts, when we slice tissue. Um, and you release transglutaminase, which then combine to extracellular matrix proteins. 
Um, so I think transglutaminase is in principle everywhere. Whether you get it today outside uh, everywhere, I don't know. Maybe you need tissue damage. Um, when it comes to the gluten peptides, I think they are abundant in the gut. But I think also you can find gluten peptides systemically. People have discovered gluten peptides in the urine, so they must be, be distributed around. But uh, I would think that the, the reason you see this um, in the gut is primarily dictated by the amount of antigen you have. And I think the amount of gluten peptides you have in the gut is way higher than you have elsewhere. And I think if this formation of these transglutaminase gluten complexes are really important, I think it's the gut where they likely are generated. Associated with transglutaminase dependent presentation that you know of? I no. Mean, polyglutamine repeats, for example, or anything like that? Uh, this this, uh, this, uh, this uh, enzyme has been linked with many diseases, but I think where it is really hardcore evidence to say that it's implicated in disease is still lacking for many of them. So, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> well, let's thank the moderator and And the good news is we just have a little bit more to go. And then we go to dinner. Um, and that means arriving around 6.30 at Seasons 52 and uh, dinner around 7. There's, um, there's room for more people, but uh, just reminding people who have signed up, they have to show up and they have to spend a lot of money or the air community is going to be in the hole. So, uh, and uh, we'll get a group at 6 o'clock in the lobby. Anybody who wants to come over on the Metro will walk over to the Metro, go one stop. Our ticket, go one stop and walk a little bit from the uh, White Flynn, I think it is, uh, metro station. And now Jamie was going to join me. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> so th the, the bad news is that um, we now get to, we have to change from all the fascinating science back to protocols and standard production and governance structures that will get us to that point of being able to do, and working groups that'll get us to that point yeah, of being able to uh, do all that uh, protocol and standardization production. How do you make this really big? Actually, make that big. Actually not. Yeah. How do you make that really big? He's, he's, oh, he's doing he's it. Smart. I love it. Oh, You're so really? smart. Oh, no. Got it. So, so we had the government yeah, document, any of that. and then people have There's given us feedback on it, made some changes and, and suggestions. Yeah, just, and just this. We have tomorrow, that. we have time to talk and vote on the governance structure, vote on the working group structure. There we go. Purpose. I don't know what that is. Vote. So I'm going to just, I'm gonna just move the, the whole thing uh, Vote on the Thank you. governance. We've given the germline gene some time specifically tomorrow because of the importance of that decision and those policies. Uh, and just to make it easier... Great. Just, just to make that easier, we thought we'd go over, but we don't really spend, yeah. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on it now. Um, but uh, the, what I think Tanya mostly has uh, worked on the values. You want to talk about the values? Okay, sure. Um, the values. What about the values? Um, Okay, so it's basically what we talked about before. She's uh, kind of just put them in a separate. Where is um, advantages? Sorry, I'm just trying to find this on this document. There we go. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we went to the wrong place. I was just getting lost. Yes, yeah, so there's a mission that we already talked about that includes sharing. That kind of fell off of it for some reason. And uh, a vision that we already talked about and our values, and all this is going to eventually go into a constitution um, later on. But is there anything that, um, and there will then be a vote, a motion to adopt 
this tomorrow and a motion uh, to form uh, this air C section of the antibody society that will happen tomorrow. Are there any questions about any of this? It's just so that we can kind of just go through it really fast tomorrow and you can think about it or suggest changes now because we won't have that much time tomorrow. And it, so I can keep going? Okay, good. Really, actually, no. I just wrote the vision statement. So you had mission and values. So I pulled a vision statement out of the value yeah. statement and turned it into vision and right. Values. But I had added sharing to it. You're all good. No, no, that's on your mission. But you didn't have a vision statement. So just to make sure that everyone reads it and makes sure they're okay with it. Yeah. Read that vision statement. I think we, yeah, maybe it was in our mission. Or something. Anyway, any questions or? comments about that or changes or you don't like it? Okay. So, <laughs> no, uh, here's Eric. We got oh, Eric. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, Eric. Are we going to have access to this Google Doc? Yeah, it's on a Google thing right now. I'm not right, really But we sure. don't have, I mean, I can't read the whole link. You can't, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, well, I mean. How, I, yeah, how can, what's the easiest way? That's what we have before, yeah. I mean, y'all have been emailing the document. Yeah. Well, I just, we just got this like a half hour ago, you so could just we'll email, email that. this off to everybody. You could just email yeah. that link. Yeah, we'll, okay, I'll email that link to Dude, the registrants. To, yeah, just yeah. email the suggest. There's an option, suggest, edit. Like, you can choose how much access people have. Mm. If you email the edit, then people will be able to edit it willy-nilly. Right, right. Without track changes. If you email the suggestion. Uh, what about this? I don't like Google Documents Ooh, because then do. everybody everybody yeah. does. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And I'll tell you why because then all of this, all these changes go into it, and it's crazy making. Okay. Yeah, but the whole point is then why don't we just email it to people and they can send me their changes and we can put it in uh, having whatever. We have gotten no emails okay. except for what, I think one or two. Yeah, but like people don't care about this too much. Uh, but anyway, we'll get it out to you. you we'll do something. Okay, and so um, with regard to this preamble and all that, I mean, I think the two things that we had discussed before, can we just cut to the chase on this? It's only if we just cut to the vote, even. Sammy, I put, the, I put your second motion on uh, below the others about what you can actually vote on right now. I created a second motion. Yeah. Which is actually, all of that stuff below is just the, all the background stuff that you were presenting yesterday, but the second motion is to form a, so, and, you know, we can vote on that. Got that part. But I guess what I'm saying is the two things that are in that whole big long document, which I'm not going to scroll through, there's a couple of things. One is that, that um, there's been um, confusion on everyone's part. We, we don't know what to do about um, the executive. And so there would be a chair and a chair elect, and that chair elect would come in and become the chair the following year, and then you know be a new chair elect. And so, so the idea is that we had talked about an executive committee being a chair, the chair elect, and other people. But the way we've been functioning for the past year, two years, is that essentially there's a chair. And, um, and then the working group leaders. And so we finally talked to all the working group leaders, I think most of them anyway, and it seemed like so long as the working group leaders were getting together with the chair and the chair elect at least quarterly, and they were talking to each other and explaining what everybody was doing and all, uh, conferring, then, um, then maybe we don't need Extra, to bring in extra people on this quote executive because basically, so I'm just asking, does does anybody have a feeling about this? Do they want on top of that other people voted into an executive? Because a working group leader did not want to be quote part of the executive. And for instance, TABS, uh, they have a chair and a sh chair elect. They call them a president and a president elect, but it's the same idea. That's it. And then they have a board of directors. So. I'm just asking you, do you want other, we, we say and up to three other executive there now, yeah. members, do you want that or can we just get rid of the other executive member? Like, what, what do you want here? 
Well, in tabs, the board of directors are just basically, we meet once a year and they may have like a phone in meeting if there's something big that needs to be decided. But what we, what we do, okay, well, so we could just say three up to three extra people. And so if that's the case, anybody that wants to be on it, like you, Danny, maybe, um, uh, just say you want to be on it and we'll just put you on the thing and we'll vote on it tomorrow. Because, I mean, basically you need people to step up the plate. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, do you want to say one to three extra people, or two extra oh, people? Up or? to three. Up to three. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, amongst yourselves, please think about stepping up to the plate on this. We don't have anyone to do it. Okay. So and, tomorrow, just Rich and we'll. And then there's the vote, right? I, re I rewrote the vote here. Oh, okay. And then the only other thing that's really different that because you've we don't want to go through this. We want to go get a beer <laughs> or something. Um, and that is that where, for instance, somebody let's say one of the what working groups writes a paper and they want to send the paper in on behalf of the air community, which has already been done. <clears throat> then what's going to happen is. You know, the uh, the executive plus the working groups, all those guys are going to look at the paper, discuss it, throw comments around, play around with the paper. And then once they think it's ready to go out, it's going to go out to the air community, which, again, is whoever showed up at the last meeting, basically. It's going to go out to everybody. And a lot of people, I think on the last one, do you guys remember your numbers? Like, how many people do we send it out to and how many people got back to us? Well, in terms of the 2015, 2016 eligible voters, there's 187, and I think what we got 94 back on the okay, so, working group. Okay, so that's good. So what we're thinking is that we need at least 25% of the people we mail out to to come back with an answer, a vote, and then of those votes, two-thirds of them need to be on side. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you like those numbers? Does that seem reasonable? It's kind of a minimum. Is Christian here? Yeah, I already talked to him. He's fine yeah. with it. So, yes? Okay, so are, is there anything else that we need to... Does anybody have any other concerns yet? Yeah, can you just clarify membership? Because you did say, I think, yesterday is something about... Uh, for this who, one, who for this year, all, all it's previous. everybody before okay, plus so that, now. That is, therefore... How how large a group is that now? Yeah, well, that'll be two thirty, two forty, I guess. Yeah, I just don't want us to be. Cool. Yeah, it'll be two thirty, but for that year. But then next, the next year, when, that's just for one year, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next, because it's an annual thing, so the next year, it'll be whoever attends virtually, like all those other people go away. It's whoever attends virtually, whoever attends face to face, and whoever pays. To become, you know, they can always just go on the tabs thing and say that they're. Uh, we have, we're going to have a special way of doing that. That you're part of the air section, and you pay a hundred dollars. And if you're a postdoc, you pay fifty or twenty-five. And if you're a grad student, you pay zero. That's how it works for tabs. Does that sound good? Are we good on that? Yeah, because we wanted to bring everybody into the first year, uh, for sure, um, based on the way we've been doing it. Okay, yeah, so do, is that, yeah? I wonder if that membership thing, if somebody's working on a working group, can't make the meeting. So working group membership, should that um, oh, so, guarantee uh, um, membership? Not necessarily, and I'll tell you why. Because, uh, for instance, we may have people from IUIS or Focus that we're bringing in the, it, one of our terms is, is that the working groups do not have to be members. One, at least one of the working group leaders has to be a member because they have to come back and be part of all this voting and everything. But if you have more than one working group leader, like they don't all have to be. Uh, so, um, And the reason why we're doing that is because we want the working groups to be the best expertise that's out there. Maybe we're pulling people in from AAI. Maybe we're pulling them in from... I don't know, whatever, other groups, and so that's why. So we don't want to force anybody to be a member that doesn't want to be. But that's a good point. We could make them an honorary member. It's right in there. 
somewhere we say here, yeah, we want to have the working groups be the best people possible so they don't have to be members of the... Yeah, because they may be representing... Hmm. Right, but if they're on a working group and they want that, then all they have to do is just, I don't know. I mean, I just really don't... Yeah, and so I think I, they can always attend and vote virtually, like anybody can. Uh, and we could also make it, no, they need to be part of the discussion at least, yeah. So, and, and but the point is, is that we may have representation from actual other groups on, on those virtual committees. I mean, on those working groups. Okay, you're, now you guys are probably totally bored. I see a lot of people looking at their phones. So are we done? What? <laughs> well, we'll start over, Dan. No problem. Okay. okay, so Dan, is there anybody else that wants to stand for um, executive uh, committee? Oh, for the member of the executive. Oh, all right. We've got Scott. All right, Scott. Oh, cool. Sweet. Okay, that means you actually have to attend the, those meetings when you can. When you can. Mm -hmm. It's no. It's, it's not really a board. It's an executive. All right. Okay. So we'll lead a group from 6 o'clock from the lobby to Seasons 52. Other than that, show up at Seasons 52 at 6.30. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yay. Yay, yeah.